Well, good afternoon, and we have a great uh, discussion today ranging around the effective communication and the training of the next generation. I thought that we would just uh, take a few seconds here, guys, and uh, let you each introduce yourself and where you're from, and uh, we'll jump right in there. Uh, Ka Catherine, you want to you wanna start us off? Sure. Um, my name is Catherine Drury, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the High Plains Underground Water Conservation District, and I'm uh, calling in from Ropesville, USA. All right, Amy, how about you? Hi, I'm a science educator and a data analyst, and I live in Haven, Kansas. Mr. Smith, please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm David Smith. I'm an Extension uh, Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in College Station. And uh, Mr. McDaniel, please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I am Jared McDaniel. I farm and ranch in the Oklahoma Panhandle in the town of Texoma, Oklahoma, with my wife, Julie, and our six kids. Just a quick introduction for uh, for me. I am Weston McCary. I'm the director of Precision Agriculture and UAS here at Northwest Kansas Technical College in Goodland, Kansas. And uh, we're all here to talk about uh, the Ogallala Summit and, and all the different things that we're doing uh, across the region to uh, support and to educate uh, producers and, and young people and, and different groups in our community on uh, the preservation of the Ogallala uh, for years to come. So. I want to jump right in here, uh, guys, and I think I'll start with you, uh, David. Just give us a little bit of, of who you are and what you're doing to address what we're calling the Ogallala Challenge. Well, I, I've been with AgriLife Extension for well over 20 years now, and uh, just recently with 4-H Youth Development. And so uh, what I noticed when I first started is we had a lot of really good programs for elementary school youth attaining to water, a lot of curriculum but there really wasn't a whole lot for uh, high school students. And so in 2017, with the support of a lot of folks in the Texas water industry, I started a, a statewide program called Texas 4-H Water Ambassadors. What we do is provide this, uh, this group of uh, individuals on education year round. Basically, they could start in a program as a freshman and continue throughout their senior year. And all along, uh, there's continuing education component to that. We tour a, a good portion of the state. So the goal of the program is to provide a, a broad perspective of Texas water resources and challenges. And much of what they learn in the program is about groundwater, agriculture, uh, the types of technologies that ag producers uh, employ, and how they connect to the economy and society. Great, David. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Amy, um, you're a former educator yourself. Uh, how are you uh, complementing some of this as a, as a da data analyst? Yeah, in 2018, I started to work with my students, um, trying to get them to understand how to use data analytics and science um, to make predictions. And so we did, we made a predictive model of the amount of water in the Ogallala and then reached out to the state of Kansas water office into USGS Kansas with some of the things that we found um, in the big data from USGS. Um, real concerning about the rate of depletion. Um, from there, we started working with USGS Kansas hydrologists, um, working on a harmful algal bloom model, a predictive model for the city of Wichita. And so we've been pretty successful doing that. And I started to scale this over the last four years with USGS Kansas. Um, to get workforce development underway, because what's happening in our College of Education across the U.S. in higher education is that teachers who teach teachers don't know how to do data science. We can't transfer skills we don't have. I work with them on that and also um, with the big ag tech sector um, and, and the big tech sector on how to use USGS, NASA, NOAA, USDA data how to fuse that data for data intelligence and talking with policymakers along the way about all the things that we're accidentally finding as we do those things. Like why this is very important for everyone to know how to do so that we can all get on the same page. I, I can uh, most certainly um, sympathize with your, your efforts with working with young people and trying to get data and, and GIS and analytics in front of young people and getting them to, to, to think about this a little bit. Catherine, your district has been working on, we'll call it the Ogallala Challenge for since the 50s. Uh, you want to tell us kind of what your current chapter uh, 
of challenges are? Absolutely. You're right, Weston. We are, or the High Plains Water District is the oldest and largest groundwater conservation district in Texas. And we've had an education and communications program since 1954. That's the year we started our newsletter, the cross section, and it's still going strong. We've got an online version that goes out um, twice a month in an email and then a printed edition that's mailed once a month. So in the last 67 years, we have provided water information and education to a wide range of audiences, everyone from first graders to farmers and, and really everyone in between and beyond. Um, platforms for delivering the information have obviously changed over the years, you know, with the introduction of social media, of course, and, and especially during the pandemic, you know, we're doing far more Zoom presentations, kind of like today, um, than in-person presentations. And our visits to schools and field trips to our office have greatly decreased, you know, due to um, due to COVID precautions. So at this time, we're really focusing on delivering our message digitally. Uh, one of the tools that we have available for people to see groundwater data in real time is an interactive web map. Um, it's found at map.hpwd.org. We've got drillers logs on tens of thousands of wells throughout our district, water level measurement data, hydraulic atlases, all kinds of great stuff. Um, and this all really helps people understand the bigger picture of declines and, and spark a conversation about water use. This fall, we started sponsoring a new online educational platform for fifth graders in the district called Tinker. And it's um, it's been great so far. It allows the students to really learn about the Ogallala and Playa Lakes and conservation. And we even have an ag section in there so the kids can learn about you know, how is water used in agriculture and how water is used to clothe and feed us. And so it also comes with a kit for the kids and their families to retrofit their homes with water saving devices like high efficiency shower heads and faucet aerators. But, but one audience that we're really focusing on this year is our domestic well owners. You know, we've seen a lot of growth in the areas outside of a municipal water district, outside of a town. Um, and so these people are relying on well water that have maybe never had a well or heard of a well before. And so we're really trying to educate these homeowners on well maintenance, you know, how does the aquifer function and, and how can they conserve every drop of water pulled from the Ogallala aquifer as possible. But, but overall, High Plains Water District's education and outreach goals are really to empower kids and, and adults alike to make better water management decisions and and to spread the, the message and of the importance of water and its conservation. Thank you, Catherine. I think that's fantastic. Uh, I want to make a segue to Jared here. You were talking about uh, online platforms and social media and, uh, and broadcast is a wonderful way to get a message out. And uh, Jared, I'd like you to introduce yourself at, not only as an irrigator down there in the panhandle, but also uh, share with our, our audience uh, what you've been doing with your, with your podcast and your, uh, your online um, all right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I farm a ranch down here and uh, something that uh, I guess the Ogallala experience or whatever it is, uh, that's just my existence. Uh, I actively use water from the Ogallala to raise crops and livestock and, and basically I'm, I'm ground zero for, for what it's like to use and uh, also live and have an asset that's tied to the water levels of that asset or you know the aquifer in general um part of my social media platform has just been being out there and actively having discussions you know pretty uncensored that's actually the name of the podcast is ag uncensored um i just am a very big proponent of having open discussion that's that's one of the things that uh, you know intrigued me about being on this panel and even participating is this is a group of uh you know i'm typically interacting with producers and people in my uh wheelhouse i guess is the best way to put it you know guys uh, like-minded people that we use the aquifer now there's also everybody lives within it or above it you know is dependent upon it too so that's an interesting perspective whenever you kind of commingle those but they're definitely different and there's nothing wrong with that that's just part of the reality of this world is we have to address both sides of the issues and and also look at it from an economic perspective i mean typically at the end of the day money drives all the decisions that happen i mean you can have all the ideas and discussions and panels and everything in the world you want but when it comes down to the realities a lot of that comes down to just you know what happens with the money and, and things that water is used for. So through effort and uh, time and time and error, you know, a lot of it, <laughs> I learned how to do all this by picking it up and actually doing it, watching YouTube videos. Uh, no one taught me, you know, I had friends that I asked, but if you want to communicate, you just find a way to do it. That's, that's pretty much what I've found out. So thank you.
we found out as being a, a vocational institution, uh, Jared, um, we're all hands-on wires and pliers up here. There is something experientially to being being out and physically working uh, on, on the farm and working with equipment. Uh, I, I can totally relate uh, to having those uncensored conversations. Uh, uh, Two-thirds of our students that come into our program are producers, fourth, fifth generation producers coming out of Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska. And uh, what, we, what we try to do is address perceived fears and, 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 and then put facts back in, in front of that. And we've, we've seen monumental success with that. Um, you brought something up, Jared, that I, it's a perfect segue to my second question. And uh, David, I'm gonna start with you and keep on going around here. The, the question is, what is the biggest challenge in your opinion in moving from talk to the action that Jared was talking about? And uh, in order to get from talk to action, what would we need to change to do that? Go ahead, David. From my perspective, it's, it's uh, making the commitment or making the investment in the young people who have an expressed an interest in, 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 in continuing in agriculture um, and who, who end in, in water industry careers. So, uh, and that kind of starts from the, the bottom up. So wherever they're at uh, as a high school, let's say a high school student, is um, making the connection between water industries, groundwater conservation districts, uh, commod commodity groups within their region and offering those youth opportunities to um, learn uh, the realist, what's realistic, the realistic side of, of, of how things operate and how things get done. So investing in youth, uh, that may mean uh, offering uh, internships. I, I think that's a great way to do that. Um, I, can, I can attest from, from my program in witnessing the students that have come through, oftentimes it's just a matter of making one connection, uh, having the student meet that one person who, who has that influence in, and they're very impressionable and they're very altruistic, this new generation. They're following uh, their, their interest. And so I think if we encourage that by offering opportunities like internships, uh, scholarships, um, hands-on experiences, like a lot of we, we are already doing, um, that really has a, a large influence on, on what, if they're going to university, what degree program that they follow or career paths. There's, there's a lot of my students that come from um, rural areas or, uh, that um, just aren't aware of the vast diversity in the water and agriculture industry and things that they could do. And so uh, they learn early on in, in the ambassadors program is the types of career opportunities there are they are uh, exist and so and I see them changing their paths, you know, even as a senior in high school. So uh, and and it's 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 really interesting to follow where they where they go. The other thing I would suggest is I know that uh, this project and a lot others like this are USDA funded, and uh, I think it's. Uh, important not to forget that whenever we're uh, writing grants and for projects that we include a very strong youth education component, uh, which focuses on uh, careers, uh, because I think that that's an investment that, that, we, that, I'll, that we'll see uh, pay dividends later on, even after the project's over. Fantastic. Students sometimes just need to have the palette of things put out in front of them. And I think I'm hearing from each one of you guys, you're, 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 you're putting uh, new information out there in front of uh, producers and young people alike, and you're giving them things to chew on. And I think that's just a natural a human thing we, we like to do. Amy, you want to you wanna go ahead and uh, tell us what, what your opinion is on what the biggest challenges are moving from talk to action and, and what do you think needs to change? I think we have to start top down. Um, Weston, you and I talked with our um, state level folks. We've talked with the you know, Department of Commerce, Department of Ag and, and Senate committees and starting with those folks and helping them to understand the big data that's behind what's driving what we're doing. Starting with higher education is important. Um, getting those college professors to be able to teach that while they're in the classroom before they hit the classroom. Um, working with young people is extremely important because once they're in the classroom, they're too busy for that, too, too busy to learn how to do data analytics. Um, so 
I'm, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly just because this is just something I think is extremely valuable in the big data analytics and the, and the big data storytelling. I mean, this is just something that I threw together overlaying a USGS map with a stream bed map and showing what's happening with the water of the Ogallala. So we know we have to irrigate. But what happens to that water once we pull it up out of the ground if it's if it's running off into our stream beds? And so that water's going into the Mississippi, Missouri River system and draining out into the Gulf of Mexico. So basically we're draining all of our fresh water um, down into our saltwater supply. So understanding that and telling that story to the people who can who can really motivate people to understand this, who are out in the field. Who are turning on those systems so what are we going to do this is our most valuable resource if we till the soil we break it up um, we have this massive amount of runoff and so we found that in usda data last year in 2020 that about 40 to 80 percent of what we're putting on our field is running off because we've made a soil pan and so educating about low till or no till um, regenerating the soil with living roots and microbiota that breaks that soil pan. We can't really get to those kinds of actionable insights without being able to see that big data. So that's what uh, I think is really important that we do. I, I like the fact, uh, Amy, that you brought up, you know, the importance of keeping soil aggregates in a larger format in order to increase that permeab that soil permeability, which promotes recharge. And of course, uh, it's better for a uh, new, uh, nutrient and uh, moisture holding capacity and there's a lot of win-wins to that and of course the region and the, and the soil types and the parent material plays into that but that's all just accumulation of of education isn't it we we just keep building on maybe some k through 12 and some auxiliary groups like 4-h and just so important that every step of the way that we can get in there um, we get a, we get a lot of things done so thanks for sharing that you can't put into action what you don't really realize is something you need to take care of uh, Catherine, uh, what, what are some of the ways that your district are taking it from a conversation level and getting into some action? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, one of our biggest challenges that we see is momentum. Um, you know, we'll get people excited about water conservation after a presentation, but how long does that motivation last after, you know, they've gone home, cooked dinner, slept, you know, dealt with the kids, whatever they've got, got going on. You know, the big challenge is keeping people interested, keeping people keeping water at the top of people's minds, you know, I mean, for most of our lives, we've always had water flow from our faucets. You know, we, we see far more interest in water conservation during our drought years, but how do we keep that momentum going during our wet years? For High Plains Water District, um, you know, we encourage people to follow our social media pages, subscribe to the newsletter, come to presentations, participate in workshops like this, but, you know, we're trying to keep a bug in people's ear to remind them, you know, we have a water source that doesn't have much measurable recharge and, and to, of course, teach them how to conserve every drop possible. You know, it's not really enough to just tell people you've got to conserve water. It's, it's about educating uh, them about why we have to conserve the water from the Ogallala and, you know, reminding them this is a shared resource that doesn't really readily refill, particularly um, in the South Plains region. So conserving it is, you know, truly in everyone's interest. And so, we just try to, you know, keep pushing our messaging out there and, and hope people hear it. We, again, we know we, they hear it in a drought year, but those wetter years, you know, we're hitting the messaging just as hard, just as hard. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Catherine. Um, Jared, it dawns on me that in in your case, going out and having those, those uncensored conversations, that that is a part of the action itself, that just getting out there and giving a voice to a producer and and listing their concerns, you're you're harnessing the, the the passions and the energies and the ideas. What what are you hearing? What's a good way to take action? And and uh, what are you hearing from the producers around you when they speak to you? I don't know that I'm harnessing anything per se, but I do think that there is a lot of discussion that's actively had on social media. You know, back to the original question of how do you break down in I guess you know the, from people talking about something to actually doing something. Um, a lot of that I think comes from, it's just, it's such a big thing and people want to try to, to, to break it down into something simple. And it's, and it, and it simply doesn't exist in that reality. Um, to, to Amy's point, you know, when to, she knows her stuff, data analytics, but the, you know, the, the, her saying that all of the fresh water is being pumped out into the, the, um, 
you know, Gulf of Mexico is, is just patently false. I mean, it doesn't happen that way. And, you know, not where, where I live there, there's no surface flow of water that doesn't happen. I mean, there's, but it's not to say it doesn't happen in that area in different regions. And this is where the nuance and all of the, the, the importance of having actual uncensored discussions is because it's not like, you know, one person may have a great idea and a great point, And Amy does with what she's talking about the, you know, they're sure there's runoff that needs to be controlled, but in my area, it's different than what is in Nebraska than what is in South Texas. So you can't say that like, you know, maybe a shared resource, but that doesn't mean that there's shared responsibility in the way it's managed. Because I mean, point blank, I can say, I can show in Oklahoma where our rates of decline are actually less than Kansas and Kansas is super heavily regulated. Well, what happens in Kansas guys are like, I, I've only got so much water. I better use it or lose it. So they go pump water when they don't need to. Now, this is insanity. This is literal insanity. Now, you know, we're left to, you know, so you impose regulations. Now, what's going to happen with these, the counter effects of all these regulations? So when you're talking about the breakdown of why stuff doesn't happen, or, I mean, there's a whole host of things like people and communications. And, and then there's the reality of like, okay, it, when you talk about this is a shared interest, well, it might be, but you know, in my world, if I don't manage it, and, and I have land that the water has declined so much that I can't irrigate. So it's my reality. I mean, it's not like something, some theoretical thing. This is my world. And so I have a vested interest in, in, in being a voice and being responsible. And I can say in Oklahoma, at least, there's a bunch of, you know, young, motivated people online and offline that speak, you know, on behalf of our interest in it. So, you know, and to everybody's point, everybody should speak out, but it also should not be at the, you know, this is a blanket statement. And it's just very easy to, to siphon down into this little thing. That's not how this works. I mean, this is a geological formation that took millions and millions of years to um, form. And, you know, we're not going to have a, I mean, just, just point blank, you're not gonna have a two minute, a 30 minute, or even probably a two hour conversation to get to the bottom of it. You're going to need to have days, months, years discussion and an ongoing one. And, you know, what keeps somebody motivated, it keeps me motivated waking up every day, feeding cattle, raising hay, raising, you know, feeding my family with the resource that is there that is, um, you know, available for my use and my care. That's what motivates me. So, I mean, I can't tell you what motivates everybody else, but, you know, we got to exist. We got to live. So that's, that's the beginning. Anyway, just some thoughts. No, I, I think that's exactly what we wanted to get to here, Jared, is that the whole diversity of action is, this is just, this is exactly the type of catalyst and the type of conversation we want to have because the way the Ogallala and, and the aquifers are, are set up subsurface are totally different. I think it, it's, it's the conversations. I think it's the strategies. Like you said, you're living and breathing and drinking it. We're, we're restricted under 16 inches of water up here in Goodland. And uh, we're helping producers in the area put out equipment because they're, they're, they're having to the ration and, and keep their acre footage down. And we, as our own operating our own uh, water technology farm or our tech farm at the college are, are constrained by the same thing. So it does make a difference when you're actually out boots on the ground. Uh, and and I, I recognize that. And I really appreciate you bringing up the fact that having a diverse conversation is exact, and even no matter how hard it might be, is a very, very, very important thing that we need to have. I think we need to have inconvenient conversations. I think I was hearing you say that, Jared. I guess it's inconvenient if you're uncomfortable with the content. Again, it's back to when I initially spoke about the, you know, some of the after effects are, are uh, use of the water are tons and tons of economic activity. But with that economic activity carries weight. I mean, if you look across here, there's giant, massive cattle feeding operations. There's uh corporate hog farms, there's dairy operations, there's massive uses of water by, by, uh, by many entities. And those entities also have tons and tons of political capitals. So if you want to talk about changing things, uh, good luck. You know, I've been in the cattle business and I don't know how you challenge, you know, the, the Packer mafia that's kind of out there. Cause you know, they, they, and they're tied to the water use too. So, I mean, you, you, it's so deep and so nuanced. I mean, you, I could open 15 rabbit holes in 30 minutes, but you know, each one of them has its own exploration. So there, that's just where you're at. Jared, I appreciate that. Now I understand why you host uh, the media. Um, I'd like to go listen to your podcast on each of those rabbit holes and you could in, invite each of us as guests and have a conversation. Hey guys, we have about five minutes here to wrap this up. And, and David, I, you, you had mentioned something earlier. It leads to my last question and it's, uh, 
uh, what are good ways to get to get yourself effectively involved? Like careers, volunteering, in, in the case of uh, Jared being a producer, is it politics, is it education? If you guys could just take about one minute each and, and we could wrap this up. Well, I, I think the political reality is so much of our, our population is displaced from so much of our natural resources and, and where our food comes from. And they're not gonna come seek us out. So we have to go uh, find where they are and we have to take our message to them. For example, our, our groundwater conservation districts throughout our state here in Texas do a really good job at, at doing education in schools, but they're finding it harder and harder to, to get into the classroom uh, just because the, the, the teachers are already overtaxed and the curriculum's already set. It's just hard to get in into that. So I think uh, we have, uh, through this COVID experience, we've established a lot of remote learning opportunities for our kids. I think we, we should continue that. We should invite our, our, um, our students from our schools uh, remotely. I know it's, it's, you know, the reality is it's very extensive to transport kids to, to certain locations, but we, now we have the technology. Uh, we have educational programs to offer. Um, we have a lot of information they probably never heard before and they may never hear before they get out of high school. And so I think it's, uh, we need to be make, taking the steps, uh, taking the initiative to make the connections with those ag teachers, with those STEM teachers or science teachers, and let them know that, that we have resources available. Because really what we're trying to do, do is, is foster an appreciation for agriculture in general, uh, and that we're basically everything runs on water to steal uh, from the Texas Water Foundation. The sooner the youth understand that, the better. Amy, you want to echo that a little bit? What we said here, um, all of the data that we look at is economically driven. It's USDA data taken at edge of field. So it's, you know, it's different from state to state in region, which is why USGS data analytics, analytics is so important and that machine learning um, and artificial intelligence that can help us um, make sense of these kind of controversial conversations where people have different opinions. So, you know, how, we're all gonna be out of business if we don't have some good statistics that are solid, that have been taken in the field and analyzed without opinion. And so being able to visualize those things with uh, unbiased, without, without self-interest um, is, is a collective good, so. Fantastic, Catherine, uh, you, got, you got about a minute there to, uh, to add to that? Absolutely, so some of the things that come to mind for me are, you know, getting involved with your local water district or municipal board um, and, and advisory committees, you know, get involved in that local decision-making process, but, but really, one thing that I tell everyone that I talk to is that everyone can make a difference, you know, whether that's a preschooler or an ag producer, you know, water issues affect us all and talking about these issues with your friends and your neighbors brings awareness to the difficulties that we really all face. Um, you know, I believe that working with the public in a compassionate way and empowering them to make those changes can really have a great impact on our water supplies and, and through my work at High Plains Water District, I found that most people, you know, kids and adults alike really want to make a difference in the world. And their water source is a fantastic place to start. I want to add something my, my uncle used to tell me and my brother. Uh, he goes, I think every high school graduate, man or woman, should have to go work on the farm for at least one summer before they go vote. Jared, you, you, you have some final thoughts and in, in close, closing us out here on uh, good ways for people to get involved? I think that maybe just kind of my experience is, again, just stepping up and doing it. A lot of times it... Uh, it's really uncomfortable to state what you believe, even if it's uh, maybe at odds with other people in your contemporary group, you know, and that and, and at odds with the general public. But without the forethought or knowledge of actually speaking, you 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 evade your you completely remove yourself from the conversation. So, you know, if you want to be part of it, then stand up speak, be heard, um, and engage in conversations. You know, I think everybody has that uh, ability and possibility and everybody's learned those skills over this last year. So, you know, there's really no excuses to not having any discussion that wants to be had. It's just a matter of, do you really believe that or is it that important? So, but thank you all for your time and allowing me to speak here today. So that's, that's my two cents. And uh, I wanna thank each one of you, Catherine, Amy, David, Jared, uh, thanks so much for joining us on this panel. I want to personally invite each one of you 
uh, to, to come up, if you're ever in the Goodland area, to come up and, and stand in front of our students and present what it is you do and, and kind of swap ideas. We encourage our young teenage uh, college uh, men and women when they come up here to learn to have your voice be heard or somebody else will speak up for you, perhaps. There, there'll be a, a void there. So thanks, guys.